Good. Well, I think uh, we'll go ahead and get uh, started. I'm glad everybody's able to uh, attend and uh, certainly want to welcome you to, uh, to this week's happy hour session. Uh, as always, if you have any um, questions, please go ahead and hold them and uh, you can submit them to education at sagesdx.com uh, or uh, if you'd like to, you can email me directly. Uh, my email will be posted in the chat. It's tdavis at sagesdx.com or you can uh, call or text me at 210-416-4815. And uh, it's my uh, privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Sandra Oswald to you today. Sandra is a, a very good friend and colleague that I've known for 20 years. Uh, Sandra is boarded in internal medicine and dermatology and had an illustrious 20 year career in the Air Force. Uh, ended her career as chief of uh, dermatology at the uh, combined military training firm, the largest uh, derm residency in the program at the time. And then after retirement, um, uh, joined the faculty at the University of Texas uh, Health Science Center in San Antonio and uh, has served as uh, chair of the dermatology department there. She's an excellent educator, uh, and a great person, and uh, I know you'll enjoy your, your uh, time with her. Sandra, thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you. Such kind words, uh, Tom, and so thank you so much for inviting me. Very happy to be a part of this happy hour that you're having weekly. And um, as you may have noticed, um, we're going to talk about nodules in the dermis of subcutis. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and pull up and share. Let me see if I can find it. Okay. All right. I'm happy. Okay. Well, I'll start again. <laughs> so again, thank you so much um, for allowing me to speak today. And today we're gonna to talk about nodules and nodules in the dermis or subcutis. And you can see that there's gonna be some blue balls in the dermis, some pink balls in the dermis, maybe some blue and pink balls. And what we're gonna do is, although they have similar architecture, we're gonna try and see if we can differentiate between them, uh, seeing them in a set like this. So thank you so much, Dr. Davis, for pulling these for me because these are just great examples. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the first one you can see here. And this is a uh, blue or basaloid tumor that you can see is located in the fat. And here there's no epidermis seen. This is really deep in the tissues. And in here are variably sized basaloid tumor islands. So we're gonna go ahead and put this front and center and go ahead and magnify. As you see, there are tumor islands where the cells totally incorporate those islands. And then there are tumor islands which have little holes in them. Do you see this over here? Let me bring this one up a little bit closer for you all to see. And I actually like this one right here, right here in the center. I'm gonna get a little bit closer so you all can see that the tumor is basaloid, but many, many open spaces. This pattern looks like a sieve or a sieve, have you seen what those are? They're like when you're straining soup or stews, you have a strainer and it has little holes in it. So this is sieve-like, or this has also been called Swiss cheese-like um, because um, Swiss cheese has multiple holes in it as well. And this pattern of holes within the tumor islands is called cribiform. So this is a cribiform pattern that you're seeing in some of these tumor islands. And then I want to go out to show you when you see tumor islands like this, you really want to try and identify where these cells are coming from. What did the cells want to be? And I think there's some great examples of islands here which will demonstrate exactly what this tumor came from. I'm going to go here to this little island I'm circling here, and let's go look at that. So again, let's magnify and go down, down a little farther to this cute little island here, and I'm going to put it right in the center. And can you see what that looks like? This looks like the bottom of a hair follicle, the matricle area right here. And um, this is telling you that this is a follicular tumor, okay, because it's trying to recapitulate a hair follicle. So I think that's a wonderful clue. You wanna look around tumors like this and look for other clues that tell you that it's a follicular differentiation. And right over here, I hope you can see, is a cup-shaped 
area of the tumor island, right here on the edge, or crescent-shaped. And in the cup, filling the cup, are dermal mesenchymal cells. And we're gonna go a little closer, so make sure you can see what I'm talking about. See right here in the center, cup-shaped to the tumor island, and they're palisading a little bit around the cup. And these are papillary mesenchymal bodies. Papillary mesenchymal bodies are very characteristic of trichoepitheliomas. And once you've seen one, you're gonna to wanna to look around for more. And I tell you, this is just a great tumor. I know that if I look around a little bit, I'll be able to capture some other um, wonderful papillary mesenchymal bodies. So let's over, over at this tumor island right here. You all see this is the basaloid island. And look here at the cup-shaped invagination of the tumor island. And look inside. This is another beautiful papillary mesenchymal body. And you know that when hairs are developed, that these dermal mesenchymal cells help with the follicular induction. So those are two great features telling you that this is a hair um, tumor, and this is a trichoepithelioma. You will notice also that there's many basaloid islands, and you may say, you know, Dr. Oswald, it looks like a basal cell. How do I differentiate this trichoepithelioma from a basal cell carcinoma? Well, there's several features you can look at, but remember, trichoepitheliomas belong under the bigger category of trichoblastomas, which are those um, follicular tumors. And um, the trichoblastomas may be the bigger term, and trichoepitheliomas may be a subset of trichoblastomas, and basal cells may be a malignant counterpart. So you may see many similarities. But what you can see in this tumor that will help you differentiate from a basal cell will be the stroma. Look at this stroma, it's very hypercellular. This is called fibroblast rich stroma because of all these increased numbers of fibroblasts. Let me show you what they look like. They're spindled cells and they're within the collagen matrix as you can see here. And um, another feature that could be very helpful for differentiating from basal cells is that there's clefting between the collagen bundles. And so in basal cells, typically you're gonna have clefting between the tumor island, let's say this edge, and the collagen. Whereas in trichoepitheliomas, you're gonna see the clefting in between the collagen bundles. So that can be also very, very helpful. And in basal cells, instead of this fibro-rich stroma, you're gonna see a bluish mucinous stroma. And let me just show you how the stroma looks like around the tumor. So I'm gonna pull out a little bit um, larger view, and you can see that the tumor surrounds and incorporates the tumor islands within it. Basal cells often have that bluish mucinous stroma, which it needs for its growth, but this stroma is fibro-rich. So this is a beautiful example of a trichoepithelioma in the subcutis. Many of you will wonder where are trichoepitheliomas found? Well, they're often found on the head. And um, they can be seen either singly or you can see them multiply. And so um, there are some people who have trichoepitheliomas that are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. And when you see that, you're gonna see multiple flesh to pink colored papules in the center faces. And that is um, someone who has multiple, multiple trichoepitheliomas and it runs in their family. And then for clinical purposes and board purposes as well, there's also several syndromes that have trichoepitheliomas in it. You may remember a syndrome called Brooks-Spiegler. Now, Brooks-Spiegler is a tumor that incorporates multiple hair tumors and sweat gland tumors. And so you can see trichoepitheliomas like you see here in this great example. And then you can see um, sweat gland tumors such as, let's say, a spiradinoma or a cylindroma. And so that is um, something that you might mention if you see someone with trichoepithelioma. Another syndrome that I always have our residents remember is the Rombo syndrome. Don't forget the Rombo syndrome can incorporate trichoepitheliomas and basal cell carcinomas. Also very unique characteristics like cyanosis, hypotrichosis, say trophoderma, very unusual things. Um, and those are um, found again in Rombo syndrome. So I think this is a great start off to a, a basaloid tumor um, that uh, forms balls in the dermis, in this case, the subcutis. 
and its associated genodermatoses. All right, so that's the first slide. Let's go ahead to the second. Now you see in the second slide, this was a wonderful um, probably excision. And you could see that here is the epidermis. Here are the blue balls in, that are located in this case in the dermis. These um, blue uh, basaloid islands are packed of cells, very packed. But there's also some tumor islands that have more open spaces and they're more cord-like changes. So that's very interesting. So let's go ahead to this one right over here. I like that one. And let's go a little bit closer. As you can see again, this is a blue ball in the dermis that's very well circumscribed. But the cells in this tumor is different from the last tumor. Is that right? When you look at it, let's go even further. Now, derms don't usually go down to magnify this much, but I need to show you what these cells look like because these cells will help tell you what type of tumor this is. So let's go even farther down. I know this is really amazing how detailed you can get these slide pictures, but you will see two types of cells, right? You have these smaller hyperchromatic nucleated cells, and then next to them, even closer, you can see these um, larger cells with more pale staining nuclei, a little bit larger. Do you see that? The difference again between this cell type and this cell type. Having these two cell types are very characteristic of duct cells or sweat gland tumors. They have these two types of cells normally in the ducts themselves, and you're going to find those in these tumors as well. And then you might say, well, Dr. Oswald, I see some other cells. I'm going to say you're right. Let's see, over here very dark, small, hyperchromatic cell with very little cytoplasm. Here, maybe scattered here, here. Okay, let's look over here, here. It's like someone took a pepper shaker and shook out little black balls and little um, lymphocytes and they're scattered about in this tumor. So this is a tumor that can have inflammatory um, component to them. And um, these are just scattered lymphocytes in there. Um, I love this tumor because uh, you can also look for what this tumor or ductal structures are trying to make, which are ducts. Again, you see one here. Once you start to see ducts or duct formation, that helps you um, confirm that this is a sweat gland tumor. And this is, again, a spiroadenoma. This is a spiroadenoma. The more you look around the tumor, you see me looking around, you're going to see even more ducts, you know? Here duck, there duck. I talk with my residents all the time. Here duck, there duck, everywhere a duck duct. There are ducts all over this tumor, and that helps you identify this as a sparadnoma. Let's go ahead and um, decrease our magnification again and remind ourselves that this looks like a big blue ball in the dermis. Okay. And um, I want to tell you that these cells of these tumors can have a vascular component to them and sometimes make it difficult to you to see what the tumor looks like, but this one's very easy to see. Another thing I want to mention is that sometimes, as you can see, I moved to this section here, sparadenomas can also have areas that look cylindroma-like. Cylindromas are closely associated with then tumors as well, but you have variably sized basaloid nests. They're often smaller. They tend to have more of a pink cuticular lining, maybe more of those PS positive droplets that were not as prevalent in this tumor, but can be found. And they tend to mold to each other. And so it so happens in this slide that we can see not just the big balls of sparadenoma in the tumor, but areas that almost look cylindroma-like because these are smaller balls and they're molding to each other. Cylindromas tend to be, of course, much smaller balls and they um, form together like a jigsaw puzzle. So um, I love this tumor. Uh, uh, this possibly could be an eccrine spiradenoma. And I'm, um, again, decreasing the magnification so you can see their architecture. And I just mentioned that these spiradenomas can be associated with a syndrome, right? We just talked about it, the, Bro the brooks spiegler syndrome, which can be associated with this tumor, as well as the previous trichoepithelioma, and so I put them next to each other. So this was the second uh, slide. I hope you liked it. I thought Dr. Davis got me a great example 
of a spear adenoma. Let's go ahead now to the third slide. Uh, what you see here are multiple sections of a punch biopsy. This is like the perfect punch biopsy that got the tumor right within the dermis here. And I think I'll go to this one, the second section here, and let's go ahead and magnify and take a closer look of what is making up the tumor in this slide. See, it looks basaloid, again, but not as well circumscribed as the tumors I just showed you. Certainly, it is uh, well-defined from the surrounding collagen. And I'm going a little closer. I'm gonna take my time. Don't wanna make anybody too nauseous. But as you can see, as we get closer, that there are also holes that you can see in the tumor. And you may wonder, well, could those be ducts again? Or could this be representative of other types of spaces? And when I look over this tumor, I'm looking at the ductal spaces. I already noticed that there's a little redness in these several of the ducts. So I might go there and that might help me determine what are these uh, spaces. And when you look in these spaces, instead of there being clear or pink fluid, you're actually seeing, let's get closer, red blood cells, right? And so you're saying, or possibly thinking, that maybe this is a vascular tumor. And you wanna look around once that happens to all these holes. So this looks like a vascular space, very thin lined, almost like a venous space. But then as you look around, look at this one. This one looks almost round, and this one looks round here, or here, filled with blood. So this is no doubt a vascular tumor, okay? But these cells don't look like your typical spindle, very thin, small endothelial cells, right? These cells look like round cells. They're round blue cells, um, a little bit of cytoplasm, and very uniform. You see how they're very uniform in nature. So they all look similar to each other. Um, and if you pull um, out at the magnification again, you'll see that there's some areas that are um, almost filled with cells. And then you're gonna see some areas which have these long cords or lines of cells. Sometimes these lines of cells circle these vascular spaces. Sometimes they just lie free in the collagen. So let me go and look around down here. So I think this down here shows you some great examples of long lines or strings of these cell types. Let me go a little bit closer. Again, vascular, round vascular structures, some a little bit more thin walled, almost looks like arteries and veins. And as we get closer, we see, oh my goodness, these beautiful cells. And what are these cells? These are glomus cells. And they're arranged in a line. Some people call these string of black pearls. And so these are your strings of black pearls, and it's just a beautiful example of a glomus tumor. Remember what glomus tumors are, they derive from the glomus structures. And glomus structures are those AV thermoregulatory structures that you're gonna find. And you're gonna find these mostly like in the fingertips and toes. And these, unfortunately, um, when they're in their fingers or toes, um, can be very painful. And um, I'm gonna just kind of scroll out so you can look at the architecture again while we talk about glomus tumors a little bit. So when a glomus tumor is very cellular, you're gonna call it a glomus tumor. However, if you have large vascular spaces, like these spaces have dilated to big, big vascular spaces, and you see more vascular spaces than you do the glomus cells, you might call it a glomangioma. Okay, so glomangioma, if it looks more like a big vascular structure, glomus tumor, if you have more cells. And then I wanna mention also, as a, a clinical um, important note, is that because they're on their fingers and toes and can be very painful, they actually fall into that group of painful dermal tumors. And um, hopefully you'll remember some of those. Um, when I was a resident, we used the term Bengal. You, I don't know if you know Bengal, B-E-N-G-A-L. Of course, with subsequent years, my, our residents are so smart, they come up with so many more entities that the mnemonics get bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's definitely other mnemonics out there, but I'm keeping it simple today. We're gonna to talk about Bengal. So the B in Bengal stands for a blue rubber web, blue rubber blip, um, and then the E 
stands for eccrine spread noma. Do you remember what that looks like? That was the tumor that we just saw. So eccrine spread nomas also can present painfully. And then the N stands for neurilemoma, and that is a Schwann cell tumor or Schwann noma, neural tumor, and those can be painful. And then the, uh, let's see, the G is for this entity, the glomus tumor. And then A is for angiolipoma, which is a vascular and fatty uh, tumor together. So it's a lipoma with blood vessels in it. So angiolipoma. And finally, the L in Bengal for painful tumors would be a lyomyoma. And it could be an angiolyomyoma or regular lyomyoma. They both can be painful. So those are just some examples of painful tumors, like this glomus tumor it can present with. And sometimes these tumors can present under the nail and be very painful or look bluish under the nail. So remember this structure, this is a glomus tumor. You may ask me, well, Dr. Oswald, I think it's a vascular tumor. How should I stain this tumor? Well, I may say that normally, I would say for vascular tumors, you're gonna do perhaps vascular tumor markers, such as a CD31, a 3D34. However, this is a very unique structure. This glomus tumor is not made from endothelial cells, and they don't look like them, right? There are these round cells, these are glomus cells. So these are actually modified smooth muscle cells. So you can stain this with instead something like smooth muscle actin if you really had to. But I think, again, the cells themselves are very distinctive. And so before we go on, we're gonna take one more look. So I'm gonna go back to a close magnification and let's look at what these glomus cells look like. Again, beautiful round um, blue cells in a string of black pearls. Okay, so that is glomus tumor. Let's go to the next slide, slide number four. And we have again, another tumor in the dermis. This tumor um, looks like it's um, not quite so blue, it's a little bit more pink. And even from this magnification, you can see where it's settling in the dermis. Here is the overlying epidermis. And you can see cords and strands already from this magnification. No, you always want to start far and you can already see a different architecture to this pink ball in the dermis. And let's go ahead and look and try and figure out what is the etiology of this tumor. So I'm going to go to this section right over here. Here you can already see that there are blue, uh, pink strands with little holes in it. And then you see a, a stroma that looks bluish, almost chondroid-like or cartilage-like. This tumor has two parts. It has the long strands and it has the bluish areas. So let's look at these strands and see if it gives us a clue to what this tumor is derived from. So let's go a little closer. Uh -huh. So again, I see spaces. I see spaces. Let's look inside the spaces and you can see that in the spaces are not blood cells, it's just pink material. These are, this is another sweat gland tumor, okay? But this is a sweat gland tumor that has long tubular structures. Some people call this tubulo alveolar structures. Sometimes they can be apocrine, but these are sweat gland tumors. And then adjacent to these wonderful cords are blue mucinous areas, as you can see here. But it's more, instead of mucinous, it is more cartilaginous or chondroid. You shall see how, let's go ahead and take a little closer look so you can really see what the blue areas look like. See this bluish area, and then here, the pink strands that have ducts everywhere, duct, 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 within them, having both this structure and this structure, this is called a mixed tumor. I love these tumors. And sometimes the strands are popular and more prevalent than the bluish areas. In this case, I would call this a mixed tumor, the branching alveolar type. Um, however, there may be tumors that have a lot of the blue area. And if it's predominantly the blue area, you're gonna call it a chondroid syringoma. And I want to thank Dr. Davis for this slide because you get an added bonus. This bonus is this fat. I hope it didn't confuse you and think this is a fatty tumor, right? This fat is not actually typically found in mixed tumors, but you have fat in this tumor. 
And so in this case, you have one of the rare lipomatous mixed tumors that's fat within your mixed tumor. Let's go ahead and look out again at the architecture of this lesion. And you can see the well-circumscribed areas. And now you can see from here, the branching alveolar structures, and you can see the fat within them. Now, mixed tumors clinically are solitary lesions. They're solitary tumors, and they're usually found also on the head. Okay, so the head, maybe the neck. If you want to sustain them, these cells might express some CEA. Um, some of the outer layers of the tumor may express some S100, but the ducts themselves will express CEA. So this is a beautiful example, thank you, uh, Dr. Davis, of a mixed tumor. And please feel free to spend time, even after, to look at this beautiful mixed tumor. Let's go ahead to slide number five. As you can see, this is also a well-circumscribed tumor. In this case, you don't see the overlying epidermis. You just see it lying free on the slide, but I can tell you that it was lying in the dermis, but it was very easy to shell out, like this, like a little egg. And this is a tumor that is sometimes very, very hard to diagnose. Um, sometimes um, I leave this for the upperclassmen uh, to figure out. And um, you can see in these tumor islands that it gets also a little blue, a little blue in the center. Okay, and um, this bluish area can again resemble cartilage in the tumor. To me, when I see this tumor, it almost always looks smudgy. And it kind of smudge like that somebody smudged it around with the back of a pencil. It's just a smudgy tumor. And so, of course, when we are faced with another nodule, we want to try and figure out what did this nodule want to be? Where was this nodule derived from? So now I'm going to go ahead and magnify. You can say that, see that these cells within this tumor are very small. They don't look um, like the cells that I've been showing you. Um, they don't look like ductal cells. They don't look like uh, vascular cells of glomus. No, these are very small spindle-shaped cells that though are a little plump. I call them plump little spindle cells. And you see how this bluish uh, chondroid matrix or cartilaginous look to it. Um, this is very characteristic of this tumor. These, again, are myofibroblasts. These are myofibroblasts, and they are creating a myofibroma tumor. This tumor can be found in young people, and it can be found in adults. And another characteristic finding of this tumor, and again, I'm going to go out, I'm going to show you a particular area. So when I go in low magnification, you can see that there's a little bit of fibrous and vascular structure around the tumor, where if you're lucky and can see that vascular structure, then that is actually often associated with this tumor. And I'm going to look right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and increase the magnification here. I love this. You don't always see these classic findings, but this is a great example. You all see these are vascular spaces here. And um, this particular vascular space looks almost like um, a, a branching uh, tree or maybe a staghorn, or some call this antler formation. When you see antler-shaped vascular structures um, in vascular tumors, you might think of a hemangiopericytoma. And a hemangiopericytoma-like vascular change often accompanies uh, myofibroma. And you can see that on the peripheral edges. So, so look for that finding as that might help you identify that this is a myofibroma. I'm going to pull out um, farther away again so you can see the structure of a myofibroma. You can see the smudgy bluish color of these nodules. Um, where are they found? Well, myofibromas most commonly are found on the head and neck as the dermal nodules. This happens to be an adult uh, myofibroma. And if you were to try to stain this to help you identify what this is, it might stain with vimentin or smooth muscle actin. Um, if you were confused because the cells were thin and spindly and you thought it might be a neural tumor, you're in luck because it won't stain with S100. That could help you differentiate that tumor. 
Um, and um, I think if you have time, again, look at the different structures here. So this is a solitary myofibroma. All right, let's continue to slide six. This is slide six, and I have to tell you, this is one of our resident favorite slides or entities. Here you can see that someone, again, did a beautiful either punch or excision of this lesion. And you can see that it is blue and pink. Uh, so this is a blue and pink tumor. And whenever you see, again, a dermal tumor, you're going to want to know where is this tumor coming from? What is its derivation? What is it trying to be? I see a beautiful area right here. So you can see in this first side, I'm gonna go right to this first and I'm gonna enlarge it. Again, we're magnifying it. You see here, I'm getting it a little closer. Already you can see that this structure here, let's just look at this island, it's surrounded mainly by blue, very blue cells. Um, these cells are so blue, they look like the matrical area of the hair. Isn't that right? They look very blue like matrical hair. And um, we're in luck because sometimes the slide will give you more information that will help you. Let me go ahead and come out of this area and show you over here this slide. What I wanna just show you is that we're in luck because we have little hairs in this slide in the overlying dermis coming off of the epidermis. So I want to show you, this is a small hair though, it's just a little baby vellus hair, but let's look at the matrical area of this hair to give you an idea of how compact and how hyperchromatic and basophilic the matrical area of the hair bulb looks, right? Look at that. Does that not look similar to two things you've looked at today so far? Both the area I just showed you that look like this hair matrix and also um, the uh, trichoepithelioma I showed you earlier, those basaloid islands. So it's recapitulating hair in those tumors and it's um, the tumor today in this one slide is reminiscent of the matrical area of the hair. And I wanted to show you also this hair because, because we talked about trichoepitheliomas before, I wanted to remind you, look, this is the hair this is the basis gland that's attached to the hair. And, and you see down here, this is the end of the hair. And you can see that cup shape or crescent shaped structure. And you see these mesenchymal cells in here, which are the dermal papilla cells, again, helping with the induction of the hair itself. And that looks like, again, the peppery mesenchymal body that we look like in the trichoepithelioma. So we had a little bonus, and sometimes that's what you wanna do, is look around your slide for things that might help you. And now I'm gonna go back to where I was. Let's go and put this right here in the middle and look at this island. And magnify it so everybody can see closely. Here again are matrical cells. And these cells are transitioning. As a matter of fact, these are called transition cells eosinophilic keratinization from these cells with very pycnotic nuclei. What does that mean? That nuclei have shrunk in to little nuclei. And so let's go even a little closer, if you don't mind. Look how these cells are normal nuclei. Look how they've transitioned, become tiny little pycnotic nuclei in this keratinization. You also notice that this is abrupt keratinization from here to here that is similar that you may find in the lower portion of the hair, like the outer root sheath, where you have abrupt keratinization without a granular layer. And then these transitional cells will transition even further to dropping the nuclei. Now you don't see it quite here, but do you see how some of these are dropping? And when they drop, these are just shadows of their previous cells. These are called shadow cells. They're also called ghost cells. And um, our residents go, ooh, whenever they see them in conference, or you can call them mummified cells. But these are shadow cells of a pilometrigoma. So this is a hair tumor from the matrical cells. Um, and, that, and this is a beautiful example of that transition from blue to pink from the matrical cells as they abruptly keratinize. This is another example as well. 
So um, I just wanted to mention that when you were looking at this slide, you may have been distracted because much of the slide didn't look like this, right? <laughs> much of the slide had this going on. And uh, so let me just come over here and explain why you have this difference in appearance. These are actually still the go cell type keratinization that you're seeing in pyelomatrioma, right? But what you're seeing in addition is that this part of it, and I'm going to magnify again and show you, has ruptured, okay? So when a cyst of any type ruptures in the tissue, then the body says, what is this foreign body, right? It's like, I gotta get rid of whatever this keratin is. But if you look closely, you can see the ghost cell keratinization here, and then you see histiocytes, and not just histiocytes, but multinucleated um, histiocytes, because you know what? There's a lot of keratin, and this body got to make some big, big, big multinucleated giant cells to try and eat that up. And you can see them even lining up. It's almost like they're alive, and they're trying to eat up the keratin that it is adjacent to. These are uh, multinucleated giant cells that are called foreign body type giant cells. And there are different types of giant cells. We like to call them chocolate chip cookies um, because they look like that the um, nuclei are spread around different places like chocolate chips in a big cookie. Um, and if you don't know it by now, derm pathologists love food and we make as many food references as we can in any tumor that we find. Um, so anyway, giant cell, a foreign body giant cell, attacking these um, shadow cell areas or ghost cell keratinization. You may also see clefting um, as part of the rupture. And I have to say that most of this tumor has um, mostly the differentiated keratin, fibrosis from scarring, and that giant cell or granulomatous change here. Let's go ahead under low magnification because again, I always like to end with the architecture of the lesion and it's a well-circumscribed ball in the dermis. Pink and blue, if you're lucky and it's a young tumor, you're gonna see a lot of this matrical area. However, when it's older, you're gonna see less of this matrical area and you're gonna see more of the ghost cell keratinization. All right, so this is beautiful pyelomatrigoma. Um, I just want to say that pyelomatrigomas can also be seen in um, uh, syndromes. And there's a syndrome called Gardner syndrome. I um, hope you've heard of it. Gardner syndromes cause multiple cysts. So some people have, who have Gardner syndrome have multiple cysts. And that is your clue because you need to know that the association of multiple cysts in Gardner syndrome is that they could have familial intestinal polyposis. And that's very um, good for you to make that correlation or at least maybe discuss that with your patients who have many, many cysts. The other condition um, that they sometimes ask on boards um, associated with pyelometricoma is their association with myotonic dystrophy. So don't forget about those two associations. Not only is it a beautiful tumor, but it has some really nice associations, and so uh, they will ask you those. All right, let's look at the next slide because, of course, it's closely related. This is beautiful, and it is also uh, blue and pink, but not what you think. So let's go ahead and look closer. And you can see that this one should just go on your wall. We talked about this when we were looking at these yesterday. These are one of those tumors that is so beautiful, you just want to put it up. And you see blue areas, and you see pink areas. And I'm telling you, this is also a polymetrigoma, but it looks very different because it does not look like a young pyelomatrigoma, right? And what I'm gonna show you is an old pyelomatrigoma. And when pyelomatrigomas get old, you have less and less of the matrical areas and more and more of the keratinization. And you find, we will find that you get more calcification in areas and even ossification. Ossification means bone formation. So let's go ahead and magnify and show you areas of calcification and areas of bone formation in an old pyelometricoma. Typically, these blue areas are not your matrical areas. No, no. These are actually calcifi calcified areas of your ghost-like uh, keratinization, but they're now all blue. And then these pink areas are actually just bone. So let me go a little closer and show you 
wow, that is bone with its spicules, osteocyte, everything. So this is bone formation in an old, old, almost mummified, I would say, polymetricoma, but beautiful nonetheless. So this is an old calcified and ossified polymetricoma. It forms a ball and dermis. You may see some clefting. This has surely undergone some rupture of its own over time. You may have some of that clefting seen. And if you were to examine a patient who had an older pinematicoma, it would surely be very hard bone-like under the skin and pop out fairly easily. Pinematicomas themselves are firm structures, but these are really firm. And so anyway, this is wonderful. We'll go ahead to slide eight. Slide number eight, as you can see, is a shave biopsy and they were able to capture this small nodule that happened in the dermis. So let's put this front and center and look at it a little bit more closely to see if we can figure out what kind of tumor this is. Even at this magnification, you can see some cracks in the tumor. It is definitely well circumscribed. These cracks are uh, something that can be found in this tumor. And just to be clear, these lines aren't cracks at all. These lines are just a little bit of uh, overlapping tissue as part of the processing. So not these, but these are little cracks in the tissue. So now let's take a closer look. And you can see already from here that you have a spindle cell population. Um, it's very, very, very cellular. And now with this higher magnification, you can see that these are very small, very slender spindle cells with tapered edges, and they have a somewhat of a wavy appearance. I think it demonstrates as well, very here, right here. And whenever I see a wavy spindle cell population, already I'm thinking of a neural tumor, and this is a neural tumor. And it's arranged in very delicate fascicles. You can see that when it goes across, it looks like a highway, like this. And then when it uh, comes at you, it may look like a circle. And the nuclei, although they look nice and slender this way, when the, two, when the fascicles are coming at you, the nuclei themselves may be a smaller round um, blue structures, as you can see here. So these fascicles usually contain axons. Um, however, um, there are many of these cells that are myelinated as well. And so if you wanted to stain a tumor like this to try and make sure it's a neural tumor, you could do a neural filament stain. It would stain some of these axons, but you could also do an S100 stain that will stain some of those myelinated cells. This well-circumscribed tumor is called a palisaded encapsulated neuroma, or PEN. And it says encapsulated, but actually not truly encapsulated. There tends to be just a, a loose, maybe a loose edge of connective tissue. Um, but these are typically found where this one was found on the face as a tiny little papule and is a benign neural tumor. So this is a PEN or palisaded encapsulated neuroma. Let's go ahead to slide number nine. No surprise again, we have a dermal ball in the dermis. And this one, as you can see, was punched out very nicely where they were able to get the entire tumor. So let's go ahead and look. I'm going to look at this side right here and this one section. Here is the overlying epidermis and dermis. So you can see that this tumor is deeply placed. And often these tumors are in the deep dermis or even, even in the subcutis. From this magnification, you already can see that there's more cellular areas and areas like here, which are more posse-cellular. So let's look at one of these cellular areas. And let's see if we can figure out what kind of tumor this is. All right, so I'm increasing magnification and we're gonna look right here. All right, fantastic. So here you can see that they're also very slender cells. And in fact, these are also nerve cells. These cells are lined up like a picket fence. Can you see that here? How the nuclei are lined up. When it's lined up like a picket fence, it's called a palisade. A palisade. And when you have parallel rows of palisades, you have now seen a varicate body. Varicate bodies can be found in other tumors, but more classically found in this particular nerve sheath tumor called a schwannoma. The other name for this tumor is a neurilemoma, and it is made up of Schwann cells. And when you see these varicate bodies, 
in these cellular areas. This is called an Antony A area. And then the looser areas where the Schwann cells are kind of more loosely distributed, and um, here, for instance, that's called an Antony B area. So schwannomas are cells and uh, tumors that incorporate both Antony A and Antony B areas. And of interest, sometimes you could have one, uh, more of one than the other, but they are well circumscribed tumors like this. So as we walk out, you can see again, a very well circumscribed tumor, and this is a schwannoma. Remember that this is part of your uh, painful dermal tumor. Now these can be found often on the limbs or can be found on the scalp and again be painful and is part of your Bengal differential that we talked about earlier, the neurilemoma. All right, let's go ahead to slide number 10. This is a pink ball in the, in, now in the fat, as you can see it's the subcutis and there's no overlying epidermis here. It looks very dense and so let's take a closer look and see again what this tumor is made of. I'm gonna focus on this second section here. And what you're going to start to see already are fascicles again. And so you might think, is this another neural tumor? Well, let's take a closer look at the cell types that are in here. And let's get a little closer. There we go. If you look at these cells here, do you see that the, um, they're not quite as slender, although they're spindled, they're a little fatter than those neural uh, cells we just looked at, and they are shaped with a uh, blunt end. Do you see that, for instance, here or here? There's more shape like a cigar, right? And this is the blunt end. This is the more tapered end. That's a very nice example. When you see nuclei that are shaped like cigars, this is actually smooth muscle. And so this is a smooth muscle tumor. When you look at it, it also can arrange in fascicles and see it looks like a highway going this way. And then you could also see it coming at you, for instance here or very well here, where the nuclei again are small and round because the fascicles are coming at you so you don't get to see the full nucleus. Another feature that you might see in smooth muscle tumors, and I'm gonna move it just a little bit down this way and see if I can see these little holes next to nuclei. Do you see those little holes? You can see the little holes also when they're coming at you. See little holes? Well, smooth muscle uh, cells have little vacuoles and they're like little glycogen packets. I call that little packets of food for this cell. So that can be a very helpful feature. Now, this smooth muscle tumor is derived from the structures here. Do you all see this and this? Let's go a little closer just to make sure you see what I'm talking about. These are vessels. Now, they can be very hard to see because although they're round, this tumor is so tightly compacted that sometimes a lumen is, is flattened, right here and here. But this tumor is derived from the smooth muscle of these blood vessels. And so you can see how the fascicles are circling around here and they're circling around here. And, and then you get a nice combined tumor with interlacing fascicles based on the smooth muscle from these uh, vessels themselves. So this is a smooth muscle tumor, a lyomyoma. And because there is the blood vessel component and is derived from the smooth muscle of the blood vessel wall, it is now called an angiolyomyoma. Remember what I told you about angiolyomas, they can be painful too. So these are one of those painful tumors as well. They are often found on the legs or extremities and could be uh, again presenting as a painful nodule. You can find lyomyomas in other places. Remember, you can find lyomyomas um, in the uterus. You can also find lyomyomas, which are derived from pylorecti uh, muscle of the hair follicle, and thus they'll be called a pylolyomyoma. So this is a nice smooth muscle tumor uh, for your view. All right, let's go ahead to slide 11. All right, this is a fascinating tumor. Uh, we'll go ahead and look at this slide. You can see that it was an excision. And even from here, you can see some blood. Can you not see some blood? But we'll go ahead and go a little bit closer. Here is the overlying epidermis. And here is the infiltrating neoplasm right here. 
let's get closer and look. From here, you might think, oh, this is another spindle cell neoplasm, and it is. But as you get closer, it's so disorganized. They have interlacing fascicles going in every which direction. And you'll see that these cells, although they look bland initially, actually on closer inspection, are very different from one another. You can see, for instance, cells that are of this size, and maybe some that are fatter, um, some that are even bigger, and then some that are smaller again. So a variable size nuclei, which we call nuclear pleomorphism. You also see that there's very easily to find mitotic activity like this cell here. You all see that, I'll go a little closer so you can see, that's mitosis. When you see a tumor that has very variably sized nuclei or nuclear pleomorphism and readily found mitotic activity, you need to be concerned about a malignancy. And in this case, the malignancy is derived from endothelial cells. How do I know that? Because these endothelial cells are making more and more vascular channels. It is making vascular channels throughout the tumor. So instead of discrete vascular structures, all you're seeing is slit-like spaces and the blood throughout the tumor. Look carefully here, and you can see single red blood cells coursing between See how they're coursing between the spindle cell proliferation, and that is very characteristic of this tumor, which is a capsi sarcoma. So a capsi sarcoma is a malignant proliferation of endothelial cells, and they cause, in this case, a nodular growth pattern. Although capsi sarcoma can also present as patch and plaque stages, this is the nodular variant. I'm going to look around and show you a few more features. One. Um, that they can be somewhat inflammatory. Here you can see lots of lymphocytes, but uh, a characteristic cell type, which I, I don't see too much in this tumor, but I want you to know about is the plasma cell. Um, another feature that this tumor has are these little pink bodies. I see one over here. So let's go ahead and magnify on this body. So see, well, there's this pink body or maybe this pink body. Sometimes they're larger pink bodies, let me see. Perhaps here is another pink body. They're a little bit more mauve colored, not quite as refractile of the red blood cells look like, but they are actually a feet of worn out red blood cells. So you may see those pink bodies, but they are just worn out red blood cells and can be found throughout the tumor. Now, capsi sarcoma, as you all know, is a tumor that can be found in patients who are immunocompromised or who have AIDS, particularly those who are not being treated. And of course, there's the classic and endemic forms as well. If you wanted to, you could stain these cells to make sure that you knew it was a vascular tumor. And some uh, stains that you can use is a CD31 or a CD34 stain. And then uh, you can also do an immunostain called an HHV8, again, the human herpes virus 8 stain, which would stain these cells very nicely. And that can be very, very helpful. So unfortunately, we're seeing these CAPCs quite a bit um, in our clinics and at the hospital. And as you know, they can be found anywhere on the skin, again, as a purple or violaceous nodule. In this case, plaques if it was patch plaque, but in this case, nodule. And unfortunately, they can be seen within the body as well, the mucosal or their GI tract, and we'd be responsible for GI bleeding. So this is a very important tumor to know. It's called capsi sarcoma. And now we're at our final slide. And here it is, another pink ball in the dermis. And you can see that this was excised. Here's the overlying epidermis. And here is a cyst-like structure in the dermis. And I can see it looks like a cyst because it, there seems to be a lining to the cyst and central keratinization. So whenever you have a cyst to look at, of course, what you wanna do is go to the edge and see what does the cyst wall look like. So let's do that now. Let's go ahead and magnify. And we're getting a little bit closer. And there, here is the cyst wall. This is a stratified squamous epithelium. 
And as you go towards the center of the cyst, you can see that the cells are larger. Let's go a little closer. You see how these cells are larger and then they abruptly keratinize. This abrupt keratinization is called trichelemo keratinization and is very similar to what you find in the hair follicle and the trichelemo keratinization that you see in the outer root sheath. So trichelemo keratinization does not have a granular layer. And I wanna show you, because we're very fortunate in this slide, to have a hair structure so nearby. So let's go to the top of the skin first. Let's look at what the keratinization pattern occurs in the epidermis of the surface of the skin. Do you see here, you have stratified squamous epithelium and a granular layer and then keratinization, all right? So stratified squamous, granular layer, and keratinization. Let's move a little bit closer to the hair follicle here. You can see that this epithelium carries into the infundibulum of the hair structure. And so if you have an epidermal, uh, epidermal cyst of the infundibular type, the cyst wall would look like this, where you would have stratified squamous, granular layer, and keratinization, and a punctum to that cyst. Whereas the cyst we're looking at now is formed probably a little bit lower, and we're gonna to go to this section of the hair follicle and track it down a little bit so that you can see the outer ridge sheet and tricky lemo keratinization without the granular layer. And you can compare that to the cyst wall here where you have, again, stratified squamous epithelium and tricky lemo keratinization. Simmer. And so this cyst called pilar cyst also has a name epidermal cyst of the isthmus catagen type or trichelemal cyst. So this is a very, very common cyst. I'm sure you've all removed these or will soon. Um, these come out like a little baby because there's no connection. So they pop up really easily. And I mentioned that I actually happened to see one this week in an earlobe, which is very unusual. And it popped out of the earlobe, it was very gratifying. But um, typically, these are found on the scalp and you'll find them as dermal movable nodules. And like I say, um, very nice to excise. So again, pilar cyst is your number 12 and that is the last slide that we have for you today. And uh, so I hope you enjoy these balls in the dermis and hope you go ahead and ponder other entities that have balls in the dermis. Maybe you can think of a few, there's actually quite a few. You might think of a nodrohydradenoma, what that looks like, or a giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath, what that might look like, or even metastatic melanoma. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your happy hour, and I will too. Thank you so much for letting me participate.